Hello, welcome replay viewers. My name is Chris and I'm scoping with Bookstream TV on our book for August, Black Box Thinking by Matthew Saeed. This is the book right here and uh, gee, we're reading right along. I guess my bookmark is, well, almost halfway through, which makes sense because the month is progressing along pretty good. And uh, today the, the topic is the nozzle paradox paradox and this is chapter seven um we're we're actually in today's actual scope topic hi from istanbul welcome we're actually uh covering the second half of the chapter but i didn't get to scope yesterday so i'm and i'm kind of stuck on one area of the of the chapter which is toward the beginning so i just want to scope on that because it's what i really got a lot of light bulb moments from myself so i thought i'd scope on that it's not it's such a rich chapter you could you could scope every day for a month on this one chapter i i kid you not so um anyway so this example or the nozzle um paradox what it's all about is it was a company named unilever that produced detergent and you know detergent that ended up being sold like bold and that kind of thing back when it was uh, I suppose they still make powder detergent but I don't buy it anymore but uh, they had these nozzles that would clog up and they were real inefficient they wouldn't work so either they would clog up completely or they'd end up spitting out you know really thick granules of detergent or too thin they couldn't get any consistency so this was a real problem for their company and they put a team of mathematicians to design a better nozzle. They got them busy trying to, to do that. And this team, despite their extreme skills and knowledge of, of math and how things should work, you know, design-wise, they failed to make a better nozzle. And so after that, oh my God, my cat is crying. <laughs> She's been acting really funny lately. She's like goes into the bathroom and acts like there's a ghost in there or something. But anyway, the next thing that they tried was they put a team of biologists on the job and that team they didn't have any design capability or knowledge whatsoever but what they did was they they took the existing nozzle and then they recreated it 10 times with slight changes and then they went and tested all 10 of those nozzles and if there was any prove, improvement at all they chose the one that was the best and then they did it again. They they would make slight changes to, to that best prototype, make 10 more, and go right back out and test them. And they wound up, he said, the author says that it took 45 generations of it, 449 failures before they finally got a nozzle that was just right for what they needed. That was It was just, you know, but they had to learn from failure, which is what this whole book is about. It's about how success depends on failure you have to be willing to test and try um, or there will be consequences you know and we've read about people being in prison for 19 years wrongfully we've read about you know someone else getting murdered because they didn't have the right guy we've read about planes going down about operations you know uh, going awry and a patient dying when if you really looked at the case you know um in retrospect, you could see there was there was a chance, you know, and there was a uh, there was some uh, you know misperceptions, lost track of time, things like that. So anyway, this whole book is about how you have to learn from failure, and he also he talks about how the the two components of a company or a, a system that does work is you have to harness errors, you have to learn from the errors, and you have to have the right mindset. Which, you know, so far he's talked about the mindset of, you know, allowing the workers or allowing people to come forward with the mistakes so that they can scrutinize and learn from it. And, you know, making it uh, not, uh, you know, not punishing them from coming forward with their mistakes like the, the pilots do. And now in some special hospitals where the nurses are able, and doctors are able to report the failures. So what... What really got me interested in this, as I was reading through this chapter, and I'll admit, I have to sometimes read these chapters a couple times to really let the material sink in and to really get it, because it's, it's quite, quite interesting, and, and it's deep, and it kind of goes out in all directions, and my, with my mind kind of being scattered the way it is. But I happened to run into a, a situation this weekend. So I'm a, a, a fountain pen 
hobbyist. You know, I'm really into fountain pens. I was when I was a little girl too, but it, that was a whole different world back then because the fountain pens that I used simply took a cartridge and there really wasn't much that could go wrong except for it could dry up so you had to clean it with some water. No big deal. But what I'm, what I'm enjoying the most about fountain pens now is the different inks and the different kinds of pens that you can get and really tinkering with them. So I got this little pen that I was so excited about. It's a Kaweco Sport. It's a little beautiful little pen that's a, it's known as a pocket pen in, a, in the fountain pen world. You twist it off and then you, you post it like this and it, it's beautiful. It's so beautiful, <laughs> you know, it's a German made pen. And I was so excited to ink this puppy up and play with it. And I had success initially, but I wrote with this pen for maybe five minutes and then it would skip and dry up and I had all kinds of issues. And I got real discouraged and I thought, what is this? So of course I watched some YouTube videos and I I got the idea that perhaps you know there there were things that you had to maybe do to this pen and there were maybe certain types of ink that the pen might not do well with. So I ended up coming up with like four variables where I had no idea what's causing this problem. And of course I'm hard-headed and I wanted to use this particular ink. It's a little sample of Noodler's Navajo Turquoise. Well, I've heard mixed reviews on, on that too. It's a beautiful ink and it's just gorgeous. But sometimes the different pens don't do so well with the Noodler's ink and others do. So I'm sitting here going, okay, so the nib might be scratchy. It might have something called baby's bottom that has to be, you know, kind of depending on um, whether that was true or not, it might have to be a little bit worked on. The ink type might not be right for the pen. The paper might be the issue, but I had tried it on my really good Claire Fontaine paper and on my little crappy notebook paper, which is really what I like to use mostly, but because I write so much, taking notes and writing. And then I also had the issue of, I tried it with the converter and I tried it with the cartridge. Well, I know I'm getting kind of deep into fountain pens here, but the thing is that having just read this chapter, I realized that I needed to take a breath. I needed to, and I, of course I have an ink journal. I keep an ink journal because then I can make notes about my preferences and, and uh, you know, and, and ultimately I ended up filling, um, refilling an ink cartridge for this pen. And I had done, so, I did, did so many things actually. I got a loop and I found out that the, uh, the nib did have kind of a pronounced little, uh, M shape like a baby's rear end basically and it needed to be smoothed a little so I did a little bit of that even though um, you know that voids your warranty but I was just determined you know I got this pen and it wasn't a three dollar pen it wasn't a super expensive pen either but I was excited about using it I'm not gonna want to send it back I mean after you see the beautiful color and and you see other people's uh, you know success with it but this required a lot of testing because I, I had to clean the pen out and go ahead and do the nib smoothing and then I realized you know oh wait a minute now uh, watched another video and found out that really you have to clean it after you smooth the nib too so take it out you've got ink in there you have to use ink when you're smoothing the nib so I became very organized about making my notes afterward and then of course since the the pen would work for maybe five minutes and then quit it, it was a little bit of a trick to to uh to retest it each time so but on the fourth time after you know smoothing the nib cleaning it up and I, I kept with the same ink, not because I'm stupid or anything, but because I really, I thought if I change the ink now, I'm not going to know whether uh, tuning the nib did anything. So anyway, this is a hobby, but it's a serious, fun hobby for me as a writer and as a person who's always loved pen and ink. But with this idea that I have to challenge my assumptions, I have to go about it in a scientific way, you know, test what you know test each time and and really I couldn't do six things and then test I really needed to do one thing at a time so for a while I kept that converter on there I thought the trouble might be the converter but I knew I had trouble with the nib too so you know anyway I went through systematically and I tried not to change too many variables at a time so that I would catch the winning 
you know, action. I'm not sure I'd ever purchase another one, but I, I had worked with it all day yesterday, off and on, because my theory was I need to set this pen down, retry it, because I, I like a pen that starts immediately. You know, I'm not, if I want to, <laughs> if, I, if I can't get that in a fountain pen, then there's plenty of gel pens that would provide that. But there's nothing like a really smooth fountain pen. You can write extremely fast, real beautiful, lots of choice of ink color. So, you know, that's just a side note, but it shows how we can relate this material to what we are doing, you know, in our lives. And there are lots more important things that we can translate it to, but my theory is if I can grasp this material in relation to a hobby, something that's fun that I love, then it's going to translate to other areas of my life, like relationships, like work, like you know, any other kind of, you know, issue that I'm trying to solve, including the weight, the weight loss issue, for quite frankly, you know, I haven't been as scientific as I can be on making changes, recording them, trying again, you know, and, and being real systematic about it. And, and what's the good news? What's the really exciting news is that just like in this unilever nozzle problem, the people that ended up solving it were not the people that were the most skilled or the most, um, you know, intellectually suitable to solve the problem. It was the people, which I have no doubt they were smart individuals, but a team of biologists, but they were willing to keep tri trial and error going, you know, trying, testing, you know, improving and then testing again. You know, and it might be an extreme example. It probably took quite a while to get that, but it was worth it to him in the long run. And it was worth it to me <laughs> to be able to write with this awesome pen, you know, because this is the first pen that I actually have gotten that, um, well, it's my second German made pen, but it's really the first pen that ever gave me much trouble at all. So I really was kind of kind of naive. I didn't realize that you could have a lot of troubles. You could have paper stuck in the nib. You could have, um, you know, all kinds of little, uh, maybe the nib might be too tight. The tines might be too tight. I thought, oh Lord, now I know what can go wrong. But that's good because it empowers, uh, it empowers us when we know. And especially keeping the ink journal and knowing what happened with this one. It would also, you know, if a new, uh, you know, awesomely pretty purple color came out, I would know what I might be up against and how much, you know, it might take of tinkering to make it work. Now, I know that I've not covered the whole chapter. I've really kind of confined myself to the first part of the chapter. And there's so much more in this chapter leading us, helping us to understand, you know, um, you know, the whole thing about the linear model and the top up testing, being willing to, to fail and learn. There's so much more there and I know that I'm not covering it all, but that's okay. I just thought it'd be fun to relate it to what happened this weekend with my fountain pen. So if you are new to us um, and you're catching this on Twitter or <laughs> on the replay somewhere, because I know these things get out everywhere, we are Bookstream TV and we're a Facebook group, but we all Periscope. We come on here whenever we can and Periscope, we have topics daily, and we have a scope train every Friday at 3 o'clock Eastern Time. So I uh, hope you'll join us if it interests you. And this book is so highly recommended. It's funny because I told my mom already that I'd give her this book when I finished with it. But I'm going to have to get her a, a copy because I don't think this is going to leave um, my bookshelf. It's going to be a keeper for sure because it's not something you can digest and fully integrate right away with one read which i think is awesome so anyway this is probably my, one of my longer scopes thank you for joining me thank you replay viewers if you got this far you rock and i will see you tomorrow um i think we're moving on to chapter eight tomorrow and i haven't read it yet but happy reading and uh have a wonderful week bye now